Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Elizabeth Ranieris, and I'm the founding director of the Notre Dame IBM Technology Ethics Lab. And along with my colleague, Mark McKenna, the director of the Notre Dame Technology Ethics Center, I'm very happy to welcome you to the seventh and final talk in our spring speaker series. Our series has focused on the role of technology in promoting mis- and disinformation online, the ethical problems involved, and the technical, legal, and institutional responses best suited to these modern challenges. So far, we've examined the role of scale, accountability, values, interdisciplinarity, anonymity, identity, and more in relation to these challenges. We've been joined by a world-class group of experts from academics to practitioners and activists facing these challenges from a variety of different perspectives, and today is no exception. As debates around the responsibilities and failings of larger social media platforms such as Facebook and Twitter play out on a global scale, smaller platforms have an opportunity to learn from their pitfalls. Today, we will discuss the ethical challenges that platforms face as they grow, lessons to be learned from the larger platforms in fighting mis- and disinformation and related problems, and potential solutions going forward. We are fortunate to be joined by two more distinguished guests, both with direct experience in grappling with these issues. First up, we have Julia Wono. Julia is the Executive Director of Internet Without Borders, a leading organization that defends digital rights and access to the internet, as well as an inaugural member of the Facebook Oversight Board. Julie's work, which sits at the intersection of business and human rights, seeks to create channels of collaboration to safeguard human rights in the digital space. As a non-resident fellow at Stanford's Digital Civil Society Lab, and as an affiliate at Harvard's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, Julie is working on policy and technical solutions to bring local knowledge and context to algorithmic content moderation on social media platforms. She's also a member of the Global Partnership on AI, the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on AI, and many, many other distinguished roles. Julie, thanks for joining us. Today, we're also joined by Clint Smith. Clint is the first Chief Legal Officer at Discord, where he leads the legal, trust and safety, and policy functions. Prior to Discord, Clint was General Counsel at Data Stacks, where he was responsible for the company's legal affairs, including corporate law, intellectual property strategy, commercial contracts, compliance, litigation, and more. From 2015 to 2019, Clint served on the board of directors of the Business Software Alliance, the leading trade association for software companies, and regularly engaged with public sector leaders in both the US and Europe on data privacy and security matters. Julie and Clint, thanks again for being here today. I'll lead us in a discussion for about 30 minutes after which we'll plan to take questions submitted by the audience. And for those tuning in live, there's a link to submit your questions in the live stream. So without, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. This session is entitled Learning from Our Mistakes. What can smaller platforms learn from ethical challenges as they scale? But we, before we get to the mistakes, let's start by identifying some of the challenges that platforms are facing and trying to maintain and promote a healthy ecosystem online. Clint, I'd like to start with you. Can you help us understand some of the core challenges that you're grappling with at Discord when it comes to things like mis- and disinformation, hate speech, and harassment on the platform? In your view, are these primarily matters of technical challenges, resource constraints, law and policy hurdles, or something else entirely? Um, I would say uh, primarily they're a question of, of scale and speed. Uh, the you know technology is promising. The legal and policy restraints are not uh, uh, impossible to to uh, comply with. So so really, it's the fact that a small company like Discord uh, that started in 2015 uh, now finds itself with 150 million active users uh, across the world uh, that are engaging with our product for for hours a day uh, and. Um, that's exciting for us, but it's also daunting. We're, you know, 300 people, 99% of us are in North America, and we have a, a global community that we need to do the right thing by. Um, and so uh, the, the speed of the growth and the dynamic nature of the content, I would highlight uh, a change for us from text messaging, which is somewhat easier to moderate, to a higher propensity for, for video and voice which in real time is, is harder uh, to moderate. So, so really the, the, the speed of our growth 
um, is the challenge and this shift from text and static images to voice and, and real time voice and video communication uh, makes our work harder. Thank you, Clint. And I'd love to get more into the novel content moderation challenges when it comes to different um, mediums, such as video and voice, as you mentioned. Um, for now, I'd like to turn to Julie um, on this point about, you know, platforms with global reach um, and primarily staff located in, in the West. Um, Julie, much of your work with Internet Without Borders, as well as your academic work, has focused on the importance of local knowledge and context, as well as culture and language in addressing these problems like mis and disinformation on the platforms. So I was hoping you could help us understand some of those challenges more specifically, maybe even with some concrete examples of the unique challenges posed by things like context and culture. Yes, thank you, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, and thank you for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. Um, yes, the we're talking about platforms created in the US, designed in the US, but with a global reach, at least at the ambition. And, and we've heard even at what we consider now smaller platforms, it's, it, it, it is an ambition to go beyond the borders of the United States. So when you, so once you say that, that there are of course challenges, it's the same for the challenges, the challenges do not stop uh, with the borders. They don't even care about those borders, um, but, I feel like in the way that we have been dealing with those issues so far, we tend to have adopted a, uh, you know, a loc too localized, um, yeah, the fights are too localized and the solutions proposed are too localized. When I think the localization can actually help understand the, 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 the global picture, and maybe to some extent, I truly believe that, help platforms proactively anticipate on the challenges that will come. Um, one very good example, which is known by everyone, is of course the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Seven years ago, eight years ago, nobody would have, I mean, not a lot of people. Uh, at Atlantis of Frontier, we did because we filed a complaint against Facebook uh, at, the, um, at the privacy regulator in France. But uh, at the time, very few people could, you know, suspect that anybody could access the, those personal data shared involuntarily at the time shared by uh, people, uh, those data would be accessed by third parties who would use them in a way that's not human rights friendly and that just completely disregarded their privacy. And it has had political impact. But had the world at the time looked beyond, you know, the big announcements made by those companies on how they were able to um, know so well the users and help, you know, companies target the users better uh, if we had looked beyond that discourse and looked at what was happening in countries in Africa or in the Caribbean where there are less privacy safeguards or not, not at all sometimes, we would have understood way before Cambridge Analytica that there were risks involved and, and there were challenges ahead. Uh, same goes for disinformation. One of my um, very, um, you know, the, the heart of my work right now is how can we make sure that our fight against disinformation does not become a fight against freedom of expression? And that has been the case in many of the countries that we look at. Uh, I'll give another example. When we, uh, when we hear that um, Facebook, for instance, or Twitter have taken down coordinated accounts, um, coordinated inauthentic behavior, as it's called by Facebook, uh, accounts on, on their platforms, uh, we have received a lot of complaints from legitimate civil rights activists, human rights activists who, well, thought that just because at some point some of their claims or maybe some of the networks, um, yes, did get involved with some Russian affiliated networks, they were, you know, considered as inauthentic and considered as spreading disinformation, when actually many of the debates that they are that they were pushing on the platforms were actually well legitimate debates on the social and political situation in their countries. So uh, for us, this was another signal forcing us to to say, okay, we cannot be sitting 
in, I don't know, in the Silicon Valley or in Paris and decide that this is disinformation because actually what we might do is killing the egg efforts by legitimate forces, legitimate organizations and individuals trying to use to harness social media platforms uh, to foster democracy and freedoms in their countries. Thank you, Julie. Um I'm really glad you brought up freedom of expression straight away. Uh, that's actually where I wanted to turn next. Um, Clint, we know that Discord recently banned so-called adult content on the platform in response to a policy set by Apple, um, triggering some, um, forgive the pun, Discord. Uh, could you tell us a bit about the concerns, if any, with policies like the one set by Apple and other policies that seek to limit content that is not illegal, but might otherwise be objectionable? Um, and more generally, how you think about this notion of lawful but awful content and the challenges that it presents uh, in your role? Yeah, it's such an important question. And if I could uh, start with actually our, our product design, because you touched on that too in your in your first um, question. Uh, and and I do have great faith in the technology and being a second wave company, you know, being formed in 2015 instead of 2005, 2010. I think we started with a very strong product design that puts the user first. And so, you know, on Discord, uh, you can have, you know, direct messages and direct conversations with your friends, but you decide who your friends are. Uh, you decide who can contact you. Uh, you have filters to decide whether you can see adult images or, or not. And we have, you know, filtering of, of nudity and, and other content. And so it starts with that user centric design and then users can join communities. And most of our communities are small. They're, you know, five, 15, 20 people. Uh, and inside the community, you have community owners and moderators who set the local norms and rules for discussion and behavior in that community. And so, while we put the, the user in control, we also you know, have controls at the community level to make sure that the user's experience matches um, uh, the norms and values of the community. And if it doesn't feel like you know, your community, if you don't feel safe and, and you don't feel like you belong there, you leave the community. Uh, and if you don't meet the community norms, the community moderator can kick you out of the community. Uh, and so Discord really comes in only at a you know, broader platform level, uh, because the user has decided who to be friends with and what communities to join. The community owner is moderating that community to a level of acceptable behavior for its members. And we become just a, a final safety layer that is ensuring a safe experience for, for everyone on Discord. So, so I really like this three-tier model. Uh, it's very different from a broadcast model like Twitch or, or Facebook or Twitter, uh, where there's you know, the platform and the user. We have this three-tiered model where, where the user has strong controls, the, the community moderates and controls information to its you know, values and norms. And then there's ultimately a, a trust and safety team that, that I'm responsible for uh, that, that takes care of, of the universal question. So um, I think it's a better product architecture and, and yields better results when it comes to a safe experience and, and the chance to kind of build friendships and find belonging online. Thanks, Clint. Um, Julie, I'd like to give you an opportunity to respond, um, particularly to the point around community moderation and what you make of some of the um, newer proposals for moderation that um, might, for example, rely more on users or communities. Things like Twitter's uh, Birdwatch come to mind, some of what Clint outlined, and then also how that might um, have different impacts in different parts of the world, given your very vast international experience. Yes. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you claim for you know, uh, detailing um, the, the, the platform architecture. So several things uh, very interesting in there. Um, this idea that users will actually uh, you know, bear the brunt of keeping the community safe or at least be able, will be at the forefront of doing that is uh, of course very important. It, it empowers users as well. Uh, it, it makes them understand you know, uh, well, opens their, their minds basically on issues that probably they've never thought about or probably they would have never thought about in community, in a physical, in a physical space. Uh, that said, there's several challenges around that. First of all, how are we making sure that the community is as, um, you know, diverse 
uh, moderators can be also gatekeepers. They can become gatekeepers at some times, at some point, sorry. So how will we ensure that others are not kept out of that? Um, and also how are we making sure that, uh, of course, we all, all have our own values and this is very important. But at the same time, there are values that are beyond us uh, and that are, you know, that, that basically bring us all together and, 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 and help us keep our communities as peaceful as possible. And uh, I'm wondering if by, you know, transferring the kind of the responsibility of uh, the, the, the peacefulness of the, of the spaces, are we making sure also that we're having the necessary conversations about what are actually those values that we think, no matter what the space you are in, um, should be upheld, sorry. Um, and and, and have, I haven't really seen, uh, except for uh, another, well, it's not really a platform, it's a nonprofit uh, at the Wikimedia Foundation, uh, uh, they have very interesting processes around, you know, open discussions with the community on, um, yeah, what are, are, what about our moderation? Are we happy of how moderation looks so far, for instance? I mean, they're very interesting examples on, on how you can make sure that you're not having a conversation between gatekeepers who will decide for the rest of the group and for future users who will probably not will probably not even look like your, the, the initial users, uh, but yes, how are we making sure that we're thinking about that too? And for me, one of the answers necessarily is to make sure that the, the voices involved in this dialogue and debate are not only male, uh, are not only straight people, are not, I mean, so on and so forth. So I know it's challenging, but I just hope this, you know, this is being kept in the conversation at some point. Yeah, thanks, Julie. Thanks for bringing up the burden shifting. Uh, this is where I'd like to turn back to you, Clint, and um, to dig a bit deeper into the notion of a trust and safety team. So there are probably many tuning in today who aren't familiar with what these teams do. Um, and, you know, from one lawyer to another and thinking about the difference between things like terms of service versus community guidelines. What is the balance between sort of traditional legal and policy teams to so these more novel trust and safety teams? And what are the collective responsibilities, um, respective responsibilities and roles, and also potentially the limitations of each of these the, uh, teams when you think about problems like mis and disinformation, uh, hate speech, harassment, and, and all the rest? Yeah, so, so uh, for, for us, it starts with our, our values and, and that's to, to have a service where people can find belonging and, and have meaningful friendships. And so if that comes as your as your core value, then you need to develop um, a framework of rules to ensure that for users who, who come uh, to, to Discord. And so uh, we have our community guidelines, which is, you know, 18 statements of, of kind of, you know, the, the universal protections to, to Julie's point that in every conversation, in every interaction, in every community on Discord, uh, those must be upheld. Um, and we actually we welcome input on that. And one of the benefits of being a, a smaller company is is um, being able to to iterate on community guidelines. And we you know consistently engage with civil society groups and academics, getting input on what our community guidelines should be, and making sure that they're uh, clear and uh, that they're translated into the languages in which our our users um, are interacting with us. And and that's a, a really important. Um, role of our trust and safety team is really like setting those foundational guidelines that apply to every interaction, every communication uh, around the world. Um, and then we have trust and safety operations. And that's a mix of reacting to reports that come in from our users or come in from trusted reporters. So we have trusted reporters from companies like, you know, Microsoft or Google, but also civil society groups that are watching activity on our platform and telling us when they see something that violates our, our guidelines. So, so the reactive work uh, responding to these reports and then the proactive. So we have um, squads organized of our trust and safety employees around 
uh, high harm topics like violent extremism or child exploitation. And these groups are proactively using you know, AI technology and, and graphing technology to try to find bad actors before they can actually create a harm on Discord. And so we split our trust and safety work between this reactive work and, and the proactive work. Um, and ideally, you know, the better we can do on the proactive side, the fewer reports of actual incidents uh, we'll receive. And I, I would say one uh, one other uh, group to give a big shout out to is uh, you know Charlotte and the Trust and Safety uh, Professionals Association. So. Uh, as a newer company on this on the scene we have a lot to learn from other companies and we're delighted that there's a new organization tspa which is really a, a career development organization for people in trust and safety so whether uh you're interested in getting into the field as a profession or whether you're in the field and you want to advance your skills now we actually have a professional organization to provide training and networking uh to to make the most of your career in trust and safety yeah, I was quite excited to uh, read the announcement about uh, the TSPA. So it'll be interesting to see how that unfolds. Um, Julie, since you've been on the other end of civil society actors doing some of this watchdogging, <laughs> reporting some of the problems to the platforms, um, in your view, where has civil society been successful in these attempts? And where do you think perhaps they've maybe made some mistakes along the way or could do things a bit differently? Oh, yes, that's uh, thank you for asking that. Um, First of all, it's true, we don't talk that much about what works and what doesn't uh, in the civil society companies engagement efforts. Uh, from our perspective, I'll start with what hasn't worked that well. We are, although we know that our work does have an impact, uh, we are not always aware of how our either reports, uh, you know, or yeah, general analysis uh, on the content and what's happening. We're not really sure how that escalates internally. And we have felt at several times a lot, lot of frustration in seeing things not being addressed sufficiently in advance. And despite the fact that we're seeing the catastrophe unfolding, <laughs> we still did not see the necessary changes at the right time. And that's precisely one of the reasons why um, uh, right now my, 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 my organization has asked me to come to the Silicon Valley to, well, understand you know, how these companies work. Because sometimes we're, not sometimes, most of the time, we're 12,000 kilometers away. That's, that's only for Europe. Imagine in Africa or in Asia. So we are thousands of kilometers away interacting with teams that are in London, in Paris, you know, or that are in the same time zone, which is perfect, you know, to make sure we can talk to each other at the right time. But at the same time, these same teams also have, at some point, to report to other teams, which are nine hours um, ahead. I don't really know how. Well, it depends where you're standing, but there's a huge time difference. Um, so that doesn't uh, bode well in terms of clarity on, yes, what's the actual impact, how are our reports treated when they are received internally by the companies. That's uh, one of the aspects that we're uh, kind of, we have been frustrated with. Um, the other aspect, and it's linked to the first one, is that sometimes we have the impression that, you know, it's just, we have these conversations, it's just, you know, one time, once in a while, and then, yeah, and then, things go on, life goes on. Um, so that's that's been frustrated. On the other side, we have also had a lot of satisfactions because we have seen indeed some of our concerns being, being addressed. But I would say here, it depends what part of the world we we're talking about. There are certainly parts of the world that trigger way more rapid interventions than others. And that's unfortunate because um, the, the analysis being, and we've read, we've read that recently in revelations uh, by, the, by the Guardian, by a former Facebook employee, uh, we've read that there, was, there were basically money incentives. You know, this country, well, we don't have much revenue there, so why, why, why should we care? Why should we spend so much? But I think that's a false assumption and that's a very bad you know, market decision because actually those small markets where there are no revenues, at least for now. Uh, well, these are actually the markets where things are tested 
precisely because they're small, precisely because there is no protection and precisely because nobody cares, excuse me, excuse my expression. So um, we, we, we have seen that interventions can be uh, very effective in, in some parts of the world compared to others. Uh, but in, in, in general, I would say that civil society pressure has been absolutely helpful in making sure that, first of all, there is no dialogue confiscation on this issue around content and freedoms and human rights in general, a confiscation by governments and companies, because that's dangerous in my opinion. Companies will have as an incentive, you know, avoiding fines, avoiding regulation, and governments will have other incentives. And sometimes those incentives will be to control the, co the conversation because they, co they cannot control that anymore. So um, yes, I think that involvement of the civil society has been very helpful in making sure that there is no, no confiscation of this conversation by governments and, and, and companies which have antagonist interest uh, sometimes, uh, but rather civil society's contribution has been helpful to center, recenter the conversation on freedoms and human rights by design. Elizabeth, can I ask a question of, of, of Julie? Uh, I, I'm, um, I, I think your uh, messages for us are, are so important, Julie. And uh, I do want to emphasize that we do care about uh, users outside the United States and their safety and their experience just as much as users in the United States. And, and one of the troubling data points I've seen is that the report volume from uh, outside the United States and in particular non-English speakers is lower. And, and I'm wondering what advice you have for companies like Discord on making sure that users um, have the ability to, to make reports about things that are of concern to them. And, and is there some perception that we don't take those reports seriously? Or is there a perception that, is there a cultural problem that, that is you know, stopping someone from making a report? Because our report volumes per user are much higher in North America and they're lower outside. And, and we're, we would love guidance on how we can make sure that someone who has an issue and, and has an experience on Discord that they want to report to trust and safety faces no barrier in doing that uh, based on their location or their language. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Clint, uh, for, for asking this. I think the first thing to probably agree on is that the report button is not um, a feature that speaks to everyone. In many countries in the world, reporting even the, to the police, nothing happens. So for a lot of people, if you report, nothing happens. So there's no need to do that. That's the first thing. The second thing is, I think there is an effort um, to explain you know, the stand, the community standards, because we are all with the assumption that everybody agrees that freedom of expression is important, that human rights are important, that you cannot, do. that's not true, because there are countries in which the very concept of freedom of expression dates back to five years ago when platforms and internet became more democratized. So with this, with this in mind, um, I think, uh, it requires way more than engagement, than you know, engagement on the content itself. It requires engagement on the the philosophy around the platform in general, the platform that you you work for, like explaining why the community guidelines were developed in the first place, uh, why who participated. I mean, it requires a lot of explanation and uh, and. Uh, as we say in the development sector, capacity building, although I don't really like that expression, but I think it, it conveys the, the meaning very well. So um, um, yes, I think it requires a bit more than just expecting because you're talking, you're not probably talking about the same thing. You know, when you say report, it doesn't mean the same thing for, for everyone. So that, that, that would be my advice. And in Thank that, part, yep. sorry, just to finish, it has an even a beneficial effect on societal level because once you 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 know raise awareness on human rights on privacy and etc it has a network effect those people were, are going to talk about these issues to their networks and those networks are going to so it has a very positive effect from our perspective thank great you. thank you thank you this is unprecedented it was our first <laughs> panelist to panelist question um, <laughs> very very exciting uh, threads being connected here. Um, 
Clint, I'd like to turn back to you. Um, picking up on, on Julie's point about uh, growth and profits and your point about the challenges around speed and scale, um, in our very first uh, event in this speaker, speaker series, we spoke with Harvard's Joan Donovan about the role of scale specifically in relation to mis and disinformation. Um, and obviously platforms like Facebook and YouTube have been criticized for their business models, prioritizing growth above all else, uh, including user safety. So can you please tell us a bit more about Discord's monetization and business model and how you think that relates to the way that you, you balance things like privacy uh, and user safety with competing priorities around growth and scale? Business models are, are so important and uh, we should spend more time talking about them. And so, uh, Discord makes money directly from users. So we have no advertising on our platform. Uh, so we have no incentive for things to, you know, go viral and, and, and spread. And um, instead we uh, have users pay us directly, you know, $5 or $10 a month for extras. The extra might be, you know, a better video connection or it might be something that maybe appeals more to teenagers like an animated emoji um, instead of a static emoji, which, which apparently is, you know, uh, an important differentiator that, that you might pay $5 for. So, so, so for us, it's very important that we earn our money directly and with transparency. You give us $5, you get these three things. You give us $10, you get these eight things. And um, we collect money directly from our users and uh, a small percentage of them pay. Uh, a large percentage don't. But I, I think the ones who don't pay are grateful for the ones who do because it allows us to create, uh, you know, richer features in our service and and provide uh, free text messaging and vis video uh, chat uh, for you know more than 100 million people around the world. Um, so so I think this um, this model and it's much more like uh, a Netflix where you pay Netflix for a basket of shows and it's very transparent and uh, you might be disappointed that one of your shows isn't in that Netflix basket. Uh, but you're not worried about uh, Netflix selling your data or Netflix, you know, targeting you when you're browsing a different website with some, you know, uh, customized ad based upon your your social media history. And uh, so I think that business model um, uh, is critically important when you're thinking about what social media platform to use or what communications platform to use. And uh, I think it deserves more attention. Thanks, Clint. Um, Julie, I'd like to ask you about business models as well with a slightly different angle, um, which is around ad supported business models and the impact on freedom of expression and particularly journalists and the press. I know you've done a lot of work in this area uh, and was wondering if you wanted to respond as well. Yes, um, well, ad supported business models um, have, well, help some <laughs> achieve um, well, increase readership. I mean, we have to also be be realistic. Uh, in many parts of the world, it, it was difficult for uh, the press was suffering basically uh, due to a decrease in revenue. So it has been beneficial to some extent for some. But of course, uh, Clint used a very, an extremely important word, which is transparency. First of all, we're not so far that well aware of how our, our information as users are being used by um, the platforms to sell their ad services. Uh, there have been several, several scandals recently involving, well, finding out that it's possible to buy, to, to, to add bias in how you target your, your future customers. Um, so I think, Yes, the, the idea here is increasing transparency. I think it will be profitable for everyone. First of all, of course, for those who pay, who pay those ads, we've seen that many of them do not want to participate in any way in things that are um, violating dignity of human rights, uh, sorry, of other humans, and, and particularly that involve hate. Um, we've seen that on the one hand, and on the other hand, I think it could be very beneficial of course, for the companies themselves, um, we are we are living in a time where, when users they want trust is so central. We it used to be you know a, a word fits all uh, that that was very helpful, but I do think it it does really have a lot of meaning for many users now. Not only in the United States, not only in Europe, but 
everywhere else. We've seen that, for instance, when WhatsApp suddenly announced that it was changing its, um, its uh, policies and privacy policy in particular. We've seen that in places around the world, including um, in Africa, in Latin America, people were, to, well, going to signal because they're also worried about their privacy. So I think um, that, we, that there shouldn't be an assumption that people don't want that, that transparency, don't want to, to know what's happening behind the scenes. Um, and I and yes, ultimately, of course, it's it's good for society as a whole because we obviously do not want um, companies that have extreme power now uh, also have the unfettered and the unaccountable uh, power to basically disrupt democracies, to disrupt all the things that humanity has fought so hard for decades, centuries even, um, to get to this point to be, yeah, to be put down, crashed completely because of lack of transparency and, and lack of accountability. Thank you, Julie. Yeah, it strikes me that what we've had are extremely opaque platforms and very transparent people with no privacy. Um, last week, we explored the role of anonymity and identity online, uh, and whether things like real name or user verification uh, pol identity policies might be a solution to the mis and disinformation problem. Um, Clint, I'd like to turn to you on this. So in the past, Discord has been criticized for appealing to the far right and other groups in part due to the pseudonymity and privacy offered by the platform's design. What do you make of these proposals to introduce uh, real identity or user verification policies? And how do you think about the role of anonymity and identity in addressing things like mis and disinformation? Yes, I, I, uh, anonymity, pseudonymity, and as I was listening to, to Julie, I was also thinking of, of encryption. Uh, so, so let me touch on those. Uh, we have made the decision not to have a real name requirement at Discord. So, you know, Facebook has a real name requirement. You know, Twitter does not. Uh, it, it is a fundamental uh, decision for a company to make. Uh, you have a unique Discord username and you're accountable for all the activity that happens under your unique username, but it doesn't necessarily tie to a, a real world identity in a way that's visible to other Discord users. Uh, there are some powerful benefits to that. So uh, we, I think, have very vibrant communities around you know, trans teenagers or LGBTQ teenagers, and it's wonderful for people who may not be able to be themselves in their real world community, their middle school, their high school, their church, to be able to be themselves on Discord. And that's a powerful, powerful um, uh, element of, of Discord that in our mission to deliver inclusion and belonging, we want to stay true to. Um, the other side of this though is, is encryption. And uh, while we've had you know, vigorous debate within the company, uh, messages on Discord do not uh, get encrypted uh, on the platform and they you know, remain in, in clear text when law enforcement comes to investigate a matter on Discord. And so you know, if Discord is used to plan some offline uh, criminal activity, uh, the person who's harmed as a victim or the law enforcement uh, representative investigating it can come to Discord and get the plain text of the messages. And uh, as compared to Signal or WhatsApp or other messaging platforms, uh, we actually do have accountability in that we have the plain text of your Discord messages. Um, and I think that provides a degree of protection in the world, but it doesn't provide the, the absolute privacy that an app like Signal might. Um, and um, you know, Julie, you mentioned the word transparency. It's important for us to communicate this to users where uh, if you really care about the end-to-end -end encryption of your information, uh, Discord's not the right platform for you. Uh, if you care about communicating with people whose identity is known to you in the real world, Discord is probably not the right platform for you. Uh, but I think there are enough people that um, don't require their communications to be encrypted or want to have an identity that's stable but, but not tied to their real world identity that our platform is thriving. But we need to be transparent about what we offer and what controls are in place for privacy and security. Julie, I want to give you a chance to respond and specifically going back to local culture and contexts, are there specific concerns we should be aware of before considering things like identity, anonymity, and encryption uh, in different contexts? Yes, the, the key word here is uh, law enforcement request. Um, there are many 
many governments will, which will use um, justification around security, national security sometimes, to make sure that they have access to information about their citizens on, 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 on Discord or on ac access to information related to coordinated, let's say a campaign is coordinated, a demonstration is coordinated using Discord, some governments will feel like entitled to have access to this information. Um, we at Alliance Sans Frontières, we're part of the, the Global Network Initiatives, which is um, a platform of discussion between organizations such as ours, but also academy, academics and companies to discuss how to safeguard, uh, not only discuss, but actually practice safeguarding freedom of expression and privacy. And one of the things that uh, we insist on is making sure that there are the necessary, well, there are necessary checks and balances at every stage of decision making in a company. So when a law enforcement requires information from, uh, from, a, from a company, what are the internal escalation mechanism? How, how does a company respond to that? What kind of company, uh, what kind of questions, sorry, the company asks to the law enforcement authorities before actually handling the data or not handling them if it decides to do so. So what are the what are what is the due diligence basically that's done by the company before responding to that? And even when there is a due diligence mechanism, is that mechanism even strong enough to, well, make sure that you can still respond to governments that have uh, well, that are authoritarian, basically, because not, not everywhere in the world do we have institutions that are as stable and as, and as strong and as accountable as in the United States, for instance. So this is, this is what, I think this is, uh, we were talking about human rights by design. I really think that this should be uh, a preoccupation at every level, even for the the, the smallest feature on the on the platform, it should trigger questions around, yes, how is this going to impact the most vulnerable communities? And I insist on that because these are usually the communities through which the harm is first visible because they're the weakest one and the most unprotected. Um, so how we how our products or our processes impacting those communities? Uh, do we have internally the, um, the, the necessary safeguards to make sure that we will make the right decision that will be less impactful from a human rights perspective. I think these are questions that could help and should help uh, companies and guide them whenever they're making decisions for the platforms. That's my opinion. And if you'd like to jump in quickly, uh, please feel free. Yeah, um, so today, you know, all of our uh, data and records are in North America, so we only respond to, to U.S. law enforcement. Uh, but one of our most you know, important questions to address as we explain globally is how we'll work with law enforcement in other countries. And uh, uh, I was glad to hear the shout out for the Global Network Initiative because um, uh, Discord will be, will be joining that. We recently received an invitation, and that's an opportunity for a smaller company like Discord to not only meet with you know, civil society and human rights groups, but also academics and then larger companies like Verizon. So, so we can connect with all these people and say, how should we handle that first law enforcement demand uh, in a country that might have an authoritarian government or in a country that doesn't have an independent judiciary? And uh, we can learn from the, the people who've been working on these issues for, for many, many years so that when we actually launch and we face our first you know, government request in, in a country that doesn't have an independent judiciary or, or, or has a you know, uh, despotic leader who, who is not honoring human rights obligations or norms Forms, then we'll have a better ability to respond. Uh, uh, so we're not there yet, but, but the benefit of, of uh, joining a group like the Global Network Initiative is to make us better informed and better prepared when that day comes. Thanks, Clint. Um, I do want to turn to some questions we've gotten um, since we're getting close to the hour here. Um, so the first question is around the many proposals for Section 230 reforms. <laughs> Um, but also other proposals around the world that seek to address the balance uh, between freedom of expression and um, lawful but awful content. So examples with Germany's Nets DG and France's Avia law. And um, 
maybe Julie, we'll start with you of what you make of these proposals in terms of a path forward around content moderation and the balance between uh, moderation and freedom of expression. Yes, um, for me, many of these proposals, and it was clearly visible with the Evia law that was uh, um, dismissed by the French Constitutional Court. Most of this legislation are embedded in what I said earlier, which is a confiscation of this discussion between governments and companies, which have incentives that are not necessarily aligned with human rights preoccupations. Uh, and and it, it's clearly visible on the, on the section 230, many of the section 230 discussions. They're really, many of them are partisan. You know, it's either one party that says, we are too much, we are, we are too censored. Um, we, let's change section 230 or there's not even sense, there's not enough censorship, uh, let's, let's change it. So I, I really hope um, that, you know, legislations uh, like the Digital Services Act in the EU, for instance, it, it's quite interesting because th there were lots of occasions for organizations and there was a yeah, a tripartite dialogue between not only EU authorities and companies, but also organizations which were able to provide feedback on the on, on the law, I mean on the regulation before it's 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 it, it was presented to the parliament for discussion. So um yes, I, I I really do not feel comfortable comfortable, sorry, that many of these regulations actually address the problem without infringing harshly and unnecessarily, actually, on freedom of expression and other human rights. And would you like to respond? Yeah, I, I would agree. These are, these are very high stakes uh, discussions. Uh, I also you know, acknowledge that there's a will by policymakers, but also the public to, to address some of these regulations. And you know, CDA is 25 years old. And uh, I think most of us could agree that something like that uh, probably uh, deserves to be thoughtfully updated. Um, when I think about, you know, how it might be thoughtfully updated uh, um, by Congress, um, maybe the most likely is something specific to certain kinds of content. So, you know, we don't have a federal uh, set of rules around non-consensual pornography and, and the intermediary responsibility around that. So, so there might be a certain segment of content that requires special regulation in Section 230 or elsewhere uh, in the criminal code, but but that may be the easiest thing for for Congress to do. But that doesn't uh, have a global impact and, and doesn't have I think um, um, the the scope of, of impact that that uh, the world wants. Um, there's some interesting reforms around process. Maybe, maybe you know we as platform operators need to be held to a higher level of transparency and accountability around our processes of, you know, what comes down and why. Um, and those are generally, you know, uh, good discussions that, that ought to be happening with, with all stakeholders involved. But some of it is a reminder of um, uh, the practicality of things. So, so there was one bill in Congress that requires us to have a toll-free number for 150 million people to call. Well, toll-free numbers aren't used for, for user support anymore. And an 800 number isn't of much help to someone in Africa because you can't get through from outside North America. So um, we have to be practical about if there's going to be process-related reforms, can they be universally and efficiently uh, applied. And then all of this is against the backdrop of competition law. So, so this is, you know, beyond my realm uh, of, of being able to comment, but, but in almost all of the discussions is this tension of these large platforms, these gatekeeper platforms, um, and, and are they subject to separate rules from the smaller, you know, internet entrepreneurs around the world or the mid-sized platforms like Discord? Uh, the competition angle is an interesting one to watch. Thank you, Clint. Um, the next question we have is for Julie. Uh, the question is, Julie, you're an inaugural member, member of Facebook's Oversight Board, which represents a novel approach to the content moderation problem. Uh, can you explain the theory behind the Oversight Board? And in your view, what do you think is the way forward with content moderation? Thank you. Thank you for that question. So the Oversight Board is uh, an external body, external to uh, Facebook and Instagram that makes binding decision on content 
moderation decision made by Facebook and Instagram. So uh, it's basically an appeals process, we can equate to that, um, through which users who are not happy because their content was taken down, but also as of, re as of recently, uh, users who are not happy to see content still available on the platform, not necessarily theirs, by the way, um, they can appeal to us and, and, and you know, ask us to say whether or not Facebook made the right decision in deleting or in not deleting the said content. And we also receive appeals from the company itself, Facebook and Instagram, on um, when it actually, it wants to know whether or not it made the right decision or what decision it should make. Um, for instance, recently the, the company referred to the, to the board its decision to suspend uh, former President Trump's access to its to his accounts on Facebook and uh, and on Instagram, but we're also so we make those binding decisions and we also make recommendations um, on Facebook's policies whether or not they should change their community standards uh, and we do the, all that analysis based on an in, international human rights law and standards approach. Why do we choose this approach? It's because well these are these are the frameworks uh, on which at one point in history, the whole humanity virtually was able to sit down and say, this is, these are the values, these are the principles that are important to us. And we think that for companies with a global reach like uh, Facebook, we have to remember that 70% of the, the users on the, on, of the 2.8 million billion users are located outside of the United States and North America. That's very, uh, that's huge. So it's important to have not a First Amendment approach. It wouldn't work. <laughs> uh, not even in France, for instance, where, where I worked and, 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 and lead and study. Uh, but uh, yes, we, we need to have this global approach. And what I would like to say regarding to recommendations is that although these are only recommendations, some would say, still, the company has to respond to them and explain why it can or it cannot implement some of them or all of them. Um, and this, this mechanism, I think, is interesting because it, it creates an open dialogue, basically, between um, an external body such as ours and, and, and a company. And we sometimes even learn even more than uh, through the civil society uh, engagement. So yes, these are, to explain the, the principle, this is how the Facebook oversight work works so far. Thank you, Julie. Um, since you brought up Donald Trump, there's a question for Clint. Um, after the events of January 6th, Discord deleted the pro-Donald Trump server, the Donald. Um, obviously, to the extent you can, Clint, uh, you can field this question how you will. Um, how did the decisions of other platforms in respect of Donald Trump uh, play a role, if any, in the decisions taken by Discord? And can you help us understand the trade-offs that went into that decision? You know, we make decisions uh, with reference to our community guidelines and we develop our community guidelines with uh, a lot of expert input, including references to other companies, but also civil society groups. Um, I won't comment on a, on a specific server, but I can say that um, in connection with the attacks on the Capitol, uh, if there were groups that were glorifying that violence, that were suggesting that that violence was was justified and virtuous, uh, those groups got deleted. And, and users who made message comments or, or you know video posts glorifying that violence, uh, they were deleted and banned. And, and so that was really the basis. It wasn't taking into account what uh, other platforms were doing. Uh, it was uh, looking at uh, whether someone was glorifying uh, what was clearly, you know, a violent attack uh, on a democratic institution. And so, so it was a fairly straightforward um, process for us. I would also say um, uh, I was very proud that week that we had a very limited discord involvement in organizing those activities. And I think partly it was because of our proactive work in the fall ridding our platform of violent extremist groups. And also it was the knowledge that communications on Discord are not encrypted. And so I think the reason why um, platforms like you know, Parler or Telegram might have been used by the organizers of that terrible violence was the knowledge that those communications would be harder for, for you know, 
law enforcement or or you know civil litigants to to discover. Uh, and if that's the case, um, you know, it reaffirmed for me that that not having end-to-end -end encryption was a good outcome for having a platform that's safe and and inclusive and isn't a platform for extremists or people plotting violence. Thank you, Clint. Uh, Julie, would you like to respond? Yeah, I just, okay, I wholeheartedly completely agree uh, with, with what you've just said, Clint. I just hope that we, we, we don't equate, you know, encryption with criminality, increased criminality, because that that's, I mean, I don't have data available, um, but I, I'm sure that like in the physical world, you know, uh, most people use it for very valid and legitimate um, outcomes. So just wanted to, to mention that, but I completely I, agree on I, I agree, there, there are probably, you know, uh, there are people whose lives depend on encryption and there are, you know, countries where if you're not using strong encryption, uh, you know, you and the people you care about won't be safe. And uh, there's a, a need for these uh, apps and platforms. Um, and, and that's why I think uh, we have a duty to tell the world what our policies are. And uh, if, if you need encryption to, to stay safe, um, Discord is not the platform for you. But if you want to find a community of people who, you know, care about, you know, uh, Japanese poetry or, you know, houseplants or <laughs> manga, like come to Discord, there'll be a community for you, but know that your messages uh, will not be encrypted. Well, we're, we're just about out of time here. Um, clearly, we could carry on with this conversation. I really appreciate the, the level of openness and the, the nuance as well. Um, thank you both so much for joining us today. Um, thank you to those who've tuned in, uh, especially those who've tuned in for the entire series. <laughs> um, we really look forward to collaborating on more series like this with um, the Tech Ethics Center in the fall. And if uh, right now we only have Twitter for the lab, but if you're on Twitter, you can follow us at Tech Ethics Lab. Um, and this conversation will um, be recorded and shared on the Think ND YouTube channel as well. So thank you again, Julie. Thank you, Clint. Um, really enjoyed having you. And thanks everyone for tuning in. We'll see you soon.